I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. And we are two Shakespeare nerds who decided to make a podcast about our love for Shakespeare. In this podcast, we will tackle as many dimensions to Shakespeare's plays as we can by looking at the text, examining the historical context in which it was written, and how the text is viewed through modern lenses of feminism, racism, classism, colonialism, nationalism, ableism, all of the isms. We will discuss how his plays shaped both the past and present, and, as actors, how his plays can be responsibly performed today, all while trying our best to approach his works without giving in to bardolatry. So, Shakespeare anyone? Hi listeners, it's Courtney here. If you are listening to this episode after 2023, you might be wondering, who is this Corey Lee Smith host? When we started this podcast, I went by that stage name, Corey. I've chosen to leave my stage name and, as you know, I now go by Courtney. But before you enjoy past Elise and past Courtney's episodes in our back catalog, I wanted to clarify the name switch. Now that I've set that straight, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello listeners, this is Courtney. Elise and I are so thrilled to continue bringing episodes of Shakespeare Anyone to listeners like you for free. We do this out of our love for Shakespeare, theater making, scholarship, and decentering dead white men. We put a lot of hard work into research, recording, editing, and generally producing a podcast. With that said, I'm here to remind you all that we have a Patreon page if you want to support our current work and our future goals that we believe Patreon will help us achieve. We've created a variety of support levels and continue to create exclusive bonus content for our patrons on a monthly basis. Our bonus content so far includes Shakespeare Stuff We Loved This Month posts, where we share the Shakespeare-related products we are obsessing over. Not only that, but we already launched bonus episodes. One is an extension on our conversation with Dr. Simone Chess about John Lilly's Galatea and Early Modern Trans Studies. And the second is a conversation with special guest Stephanie from Protest Too Much Podcast, in which we review Joel Cohen's Macbeth starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. Elise and I also discuss Shakespeare-adjacent content, like movies, TV shows, books, to name a few, and share those conversations exclusively to Patreon. These are incredible conversations you can unlock as a patron. We also have plans for additional bonus episodes, including more special guests, more film reviews, and even an Ask Us Anything. Distinguished patrons even receive exclusive voting power and snail mail. If you would like to join us and support the production of this podcast, or just check out the Shakespeare-themed names we've given the support levels, head to patreon.com slash shakespeareanyone. The link will also be in our episode descriptions. And if you like what you hear, Elise and I would greatly appreciate it if you could rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Your review might even make it on an episode. When you're done, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and then tell a friend. Word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Thank you for listening and all of the support you give us and the podcast. Now, onto the episode. Wow, you didn't get kicked out this time. I didn't. I'm so proud of you. Same. Listeners, the recording system that I use oftentimes kicks me out because web pages are stupid. And this time I am successfully able to start the episode right when I push record. This is a technological win for me today. It's a good day here at Shakespeare Anyone. It is a good day. Today, we are starting what we are doing as a two-part episode on mental health and disability in early modern England and in theater. Right. And because of the nature of this topic, we do want to advise listeners to listen with care. We may talk about some topics that are uncomfortable for some listeners to hear, specifically mm -hmm. around the treatment of the mentally ill and the disabled in early modern times. Yeah. So if that is not for you. We understand. We Look forward to you listening to other episodes, and we understand. Yes. 
But let's get into this really heavy topic because the reason why we're choosing to discuss mental illness and uh, disability during early modern England, the historiography of it, is because in King Lear, uh, and I'm going to use Shakespeare's words, madness plays a huge part in the plot and the characters of this play. Two characters in particular are maybe, maybe not mad, one's playing mad. What is madness for these two characters? And why is Shakespeare writing madness so prominently in this play? What did that look like during his time period? And Elise is going to take over this episode for the historiography. And then next time, we'll be discussing performance and playwriting of madness. So today, put on your thinking caps and uh, get ready for another history with Elise. Okay, so first up, thank you, Corey, for that mm -hmm. introduction. Let me just briefly talk about some topics that we've already covered on the podcast. So we talked in a mini about the four humors, which was a prevailing medical theory of the early modern era. Basically, that the body has channels like veins through which these four major fluids flow and these fluids should be in balance. Otherwise, you get sick and you have specific symptoms for when you have like an overage of one versus the others. Right. And at the same time, personalities of people, of trees, rocks, cats, all of the living things on Earth have a certain humoral temperament. And it is natural. That is how it is. Cats are melancholic. Uh, women should be phlegmatic. You know, it's a very all-encompassing medical theory, this humoral theory. Right. For more on that, you can listen to our mini episode on the four humors. Mm -hmm. Then the second medicinal medical theory, I'm going to use air quotes around medical there, mm -hmm. but reasoning for what Shakespeare would call madness, what other early modern physicians would call distraction, was witchcraft. And we've dedicated quite a few episodes to the prevalence of the concept of witchcraft, witch hunts, and people's belief that witchcraft was a real thing that mm -hmm. existed and could affect people in their lifetimes. You could be bewitched or be a witch. Right. And we also cover how do you deal with witches? Yes. So yeah. um, again, for more on that, I don't want to spend too much time unpacking all of that because we spent multiple episodes on we witchcraft. Did. If you look back into our Macbeth series, we have a couple of episodes on witchcraft in early modern England and King James's involvement. Yeah. But if you've already listened, you may remember that uh, from our episodes on witchcraft, that witch hunts and witchcraft were this major trend that hit a height and then disappeared. This trend grew and grew and then quickly sort of dropped off around the time of king james's ascension to the english throne right mm -hmm. yeah thereabouts and king lear is also written around the same time as macbeth a little bit earlier but then we know there were also rewrites right so like today early modern culture is not a monolith and we find that there's this growing dislike i'm gonna say of witch hunts and witchcraft especially from people who were trained physicians. And so we see two medical influences outside of humoralism aiding in this decrease in the belief in witchcraft and witch hunts and more of a belief in natural causes behind witchcraft and the theory of witchcraft. Yeah, because for that time, witches and the devil bewitched people into madness and like exorcisms were popular practices. So that's the madness. That's the tie-in, I believe, too. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we start to see a growing importance of dissection and new knowledge about anatomy in early modern times. And then Paracelsian medicine, which was a theory which theorized that there were external rather than internal sources of disease, mm. localized in organs rather than generalized in the humors, and that disease was curable through chemical preparations like medicines. Okay. So the new theories in medicine start to help explain what was only previously explained by witchcraft, possession, etc. There was this calculated response from medicinal doctors and physicians who were really seeking to discredit claims of witchcraft by finding natural reasons for people's behaviors. 
And they start to note, like I said earlier, that witchcraft in women looks a lot like melancholy in men. And we see the genesis of modern case history. They start to look back at Galen, uh, who we talked mm. about in Four Humors, yeah. and other Greek Latin physicians, draw connections from the writings of these ancient doctors to their modern patients and build upon past treatments for distraction slash melancholy. Mm. Three specific Doctors Richard Napier, Timothy Bright, and Edward Jordan are at kind of the forefront of this. Napier treats patients with kind of a blend of medicinal and medical metaphysical treatments, including exorcism, just kind of whatever will work to heal somebody. Mm -hmm. Bright believes that he can tell the difference between spiritual and physical afflictions and even tries to get laypersons to learn how to tell the difference. So they're starting to say there's a difference between witchcraft or, you know, Possession. Or being possessed, yeah. And distraction. And we can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And then Jordan goes even further and writes a 1603 treatise entitled A Brief Discourse of a Disease Called the Suffocation of the Mother, which we've briefly talked we about before. We have discussed that. Yep. And while we joke about the idea of a wandering womb occasionally on this podcast, mm -hmm. Jordan's treatise distinguishes bewitchment from distraction caused by uterine disease which he calls suffocation of the mother or wandering room. So he is the first to say, actually, women can be distracted just mm -hmm. like men can. Mm -hmm. And it comes from this. It's diagnosable. Not from witchcraft. Not from witchcraft. Yeah. And I just want to say that like uh, from this book uh, that I read, Distracted Subjects, Madness and Gender and Shakespeare in Early Modern Culture, Carol Thomas Neely argues that these three – by substituting a diagnosis of mental illness for one of bewitchment, it had the effect of medicalizing witches' behavior and therefore producing the categories of menarchal and menopausal melancholy. Just to say, by medicalizing it, by making it diagnosable and curable, this is literally stopping women from being murdered as witches. The curable part is like the big, is a big step up. Yeah. And their discourses didn't dehumanize distracted persons as the concept of insanity later would. So this is pre-insanity? This is pre-insanity. And that kind of comes along in like the, I want to say, 1800s. Got it. Yeah. Really, there's a big emphasis on the distracted, the mentally ill's humanity. So... While in the Middle Ages and in Greek and Latin drama, madness is seen as this like God-inflicted condition, early modern doctors start to see it as, and people consider it as treatable. And there's a lot of different treatments. So again, this going to the, like, there's also outside influences as well. It's not just internal. Right. Right. Exactly. So that idea of diseases caused by, like, a sick heart or a sick liver and we can cure the liver. We can cure the heart with like medicines and like compounds and like combinations of different types of therapies versus we're just going to let some blood out of you. Yeah. Not the blood of letting goes away. I'll get into that in a bit. But, you know, treatment, there's actually this vast care network in early modern England. So first and foremost, if you are unwell, you are treated by friends and family. They try to cure you on their own. Mm -hmm. Then you seek out like a doctor or a healer. And there was actually a very large and competitive medical marketplace in early modern England for patients or their caregivers to choose from. Licensed physicians were growing more numerous. And then there were also unlicensed practitioners such as barber surgeons, apothecaries, midwives, cataract specialists, wise women, astrological healers, and skilled housewives that patients could choose from. They could actually aggressively shop for therapies that worked. And if you were a healer that was unsuccessful, you lost patients. Mm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, practitioners were able to and did share ideas and recipes and responsibility for healing was widely distributed. So it wasn't you just go to this one doctor. If this doesn't work, you go over here or maybe you're talking to somebody and they also refer you to somebody else. There's record of like licensed physicians who actually give credit to a skilled housewife's recipe for a medicine or this girl had a fever for so many days and a serving maid told her to sit on 
a block of ice and it cured her. I'm writing that down and saving it for later. And I'm going to give her credit when I prescribe it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Healer's only diagnostic methods were uroscopy and pulse taking. Mm. So actual diagnosis really depended heavily on patients' illness narratives. So patients and their caregivers' ability to tell the story of their illness and describe their symptoms accurately and in great detail. Okay. We have records of one of these skilled housewives I mentioned earlier. Her name is Lady Grace Mildmay, and she made these medical extracts that are a great example of this wide dispersal of medical knowledge and range of viable healers that I'm talking about. She has evidence of uh, regimens for two cases of female madness, and those are great examples of how individualized care was prescribed. So Mm. women experiencing very similar symptoms of female madness, female distraction, but she differentiates their course of treatment based on the women's age and their condition. Okay. She prescribes carefully sequenced doses of purges, emetics, and tranquilizing juleps, along with bloodletting. And the dosage for all of these and the timing of the bloodletting was different for each woman based on their age. So, like, the younger woman has bloodletting every three days, while the older woman has it every four days because she's older, needs more time to recover from it. Okay. And while this may seem very archaic, I have a little quiz test for you. Okay. I have two recipes for teas. One comes from Lady Grace Mildmay, and one is a supplement that is advertised today, and I wonder if you can tell the difference. We'll see. Okay. Let's test me. Okay. Pop quiz. So, TA has senna, peppermint leaf, cassia, chemicrista pods, licorice root, caraway seed, dandelion root, and rhubarb root. Okay. TB has senna leaf, mushrooms, primrose, and cowslip leaves and roots. I think that Lady Grace Mildmay's tea is the second one. That's correct. (gasps) Yay! Ding, 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 ding. But can you guess what TA was or what it's marketed as today? Oh, gosh. Is it marketed as uh, one of those? um, I have no idea. Flat tummy tea that the Kardashians. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's the flat tummy tea with the Instagram posts? Yes, with the Instagram post. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Every influencer in the world. Like all these influencers in the world selling a very similar tea, like just some additional slightly different ingredients ingredients to what Lady Grace Mildmay prescribed. And I do want to call out that like senna, which is the main ingredient in both, is a plant known and used for its laxative effects. Okay. Yes. So she was basically giving them tea to essentially emit, yeah, yeah to get rid of all of their Waste. So when when they're talking about purges and emetics, it is literally trying to get them to go to the bathroom quite a bit. Because I think that from my memory of uh, the four humors, uh, humoral therapy, it was emitting waste by bloodletting, uh, pooping, and vomiting. Right. Those are the three purges. Yeah. And I I will say I edited the the recipe a little bit to say mushrooms. They call it agaric which is a whole range of mushrooms but it could have been a edible but kind of a tummy no-no type of Uh, mushroom where it would also make somebody vomit got it then at nighttime the prescription was for these juleps the julep recipe was the water of cowslips poppy and dragon syrup of poppy and cowslips and then applying oil of field poppy to the temples So basically, she was prescribing them a laxative tea and NyQuil for days. So some things haven't changed. So some things haven't changed. (laughs) Um, I feel like that's the theme of this podcast. Some things haven't changed. Okay. Again, it's like we look back and go, 
oh, wow, how archaic. They just didn't know. At the same time, some things really have not changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, Poppy is like heroin, but right. um, but like a, a light, a light form of heroin to see. Mm -hmm. Other cures for melancholy by physicians involved what was the best practice of the day, playing along with the delusion in order to cure it. This case studies that we have show that while women can also suffer from delusions and melancholy, therapies for men involve repairing or healing the body, while women's therapies often involve manipulating their bodies to remove the cause of the delusion. Whereas I've got some great stories for you. Right. And that's interesting. Like, there is this binariness in the medical field over, and I know that men's bodies and women's bodies, you know, cis, cis bodies are different to certain degrees. Like when people do studies only testing men, that's not representative mm -hmm. of, you know, a cis woman's body. Yeah. But in some cases, I'm also like, how different though? Like it gets this very, like very severely different classification, even though they're kind of talking about the same thing. Right. We just start to see as this ability to diagnose women comes around, they basically go, the cause is the same, but we're going to treat the way that they're treated is different. medicinally just starts to diverge from each other. Okay. And it, like it starts out subtly. So I'm going to read a couple of examples of how men were treated for melancholy. The first, this is one of the most frequently cited examples, is a melancholic man who, believing himself dead, he refused to eat. So his friends costumed themselves as dead men and consumed a banquet in front of him to demonstrate that the dead eat. So then he ate and was uh -huh. cured of the delusion that he was dead. Okay. And these are kind of like folk cures, but, you know, just as an example. And this is around the like 1500s? These stories come from Andre de Lorenz, who was a physician. This comes from his 1597, translated in 1599, treatise, A Discourse of the Preservation of Sight of Melancholic Diseases. So, okay. So these are like how case studies were starting to come about. So like these stories are starting to be passed along mm -hmm. and we're getting more and more of like, oh, evidence that like this is a thing that works. Uh huh. Another one is that a man refused to urinate, believing that if he did, he would drown the world. So his friends set fire to the house next door and asked him to put it out so that the town wouldn't burn because if he had enough pee to drown the world, he could easily put out a fire, right? Uh -huh. So he finally relieved himself, emptied his bladder of all that was in it, and was himself by that means preserved. Fascinating. He was healed. Uh huh. Other ones involve a man who thinks he has no head. A doctor puts an iron hat on him, like an iron cap, so that he can feel it. Goes like, do you feel the hat? Has a bunch of friends go, we see the hat on your head. And therefore the man is convinced that, oh, I actually do have a head. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So this is less like people in the circle, the circle of friends and family and the physicians at the time aren't just labeling someone delusional and crazy. They right. are working so, with them in this folk tale. Yeah, the folklore. Right. So that's why I talked about like that first level of help and cure is friends and family trying their best. They're trying to do, then they have this lush ecosystem of healers who can also help kind of creatively address what's happening with this individual. And at all times, the purpose is cure. There's a sense that like they can be returned. Yeah. This is a temporary condition. Okay. And now what about uh, female solutions? Yes. Yes. He narrates other crafty devices he switches the gender of one traditional case from male to female, and his catalog provides a hint that women, too, can suffer such delusions and require cures that are opposite to men's. Hmm. There's some shared fears to kind of generalize and like start to get at where people's fears are coming from. They sense men like fear penetration. Women imagine it. So this woman is diagnosed with imagining penetration. She thinks she has swallowed a snake. And the cure is not the body's imagined repair, but to expel the offending part. So the doctor prescribes an emetic and sneaks a serpent into the basin when the woman vomits. 
Oh, and goes, ta-da. Ta-da. You've been cured. Look, you threw up the snake that you think is inside you. Yeah. So it oh, does, wow. it's the same sort of idea of like, we're going to play into the delusion in order to cure it. But where the men's is all like, your body's fine. And we just need to like, figure convince out how. Convince you otherwise. Convince you otherwise by playing along and then showing you that it's not true. Yeah. The woman's body is actually manipulated to reach that same means. Yeah. That same end. Okay. That's fascinating. So differences, but again, by showing that symptoms and claims of witchcraft or bewitchment are actually symptoms of melancholy or suffocation of the mother, it is saving women. Right. Right. So it's a step up. It's just still sexist and it's still... There's still a sexism to it. Yeah. There's still not being treated the same approaching women's madness differently than men's correct ever so subtly yeah but hey they are not being burned or hanged anymore so right i'll take that victory so if all of these means by friends by doctors by chemicals by inventive you know scenarios that play into the delusion and cure it do not work then they would seek the help of a hospital like Bedlam. And Bedlam is, in talking about Lear, Edgar disguises himself as Tom of Bedlam, Mm -hmm. like a Bedlam beggar. Yeah, poor Tom. So what is Bedlam, you may wonder? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is a hospital. It was founded in 1247 as the Priory of the New Order of Our Lady of Bethlehem in the City of London during the reign of Henry III. The original location was in Bishopsgate, just beyond London's wall. Okay. Today, this location is where the southeast corner of Liverpool Street Station stands. Yeah. At first, it was not intended to be a hospital in the clinical sense that we think of hospitals now, but as a center for the collection of alms to support the Crusades and link England to the Holy Land. It would also house the poor and provide hospitality to the Bishop Canons and brothers of the Order of Bethlehem, If they visited. And this Mm -hmm. fits the medieval definition of hospital, which is an institution supported by charity or taxes for the care of the needy. Okay. During the 13th and 14th centuries, its activities were underwritten by episcopal and papal indulgences. It continued to be a center for alms collection, although over time its link to the Order of Bethlehem weakened. And the Bethlehemite bishops relocated to France. And during the reign of Edward III, the English monarchy seized priories that were under the control of non-English religious houses, the dissolution of monasteries, right? So uh, it goes from a religious institution, in a way, into a secular institution. Right. Over the next couple centuries, that's the exact trajectory. So Edward III takes control of the hospital to prevent funds raised from enriching the French monarchy. This is all happening in the middle of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1546, the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Gresham, petitions the Crown to grant Bethlehem to the city, and Henry VIII reluctantly cedes to the city of London the, quote, custody, order, and governance of the hospital and its occupants and revenues, unquote. Okay. So this means that the monarchy, the Crown, has the possession of the hospital as a building, as an institution. The city is in charge of its administration. From 1557, it was administered by the governors of Bridewell Prison, which is a prototype house of correction at Blackfriars. Houses of correction were places where those who were, quote unquote, unwilling to work, including vagrants and beggars, Mm -hmm. were sent to work, which came into existence after the passing of an amendment to the Elizabethan Poor Law. Mm -hmm. And these establishments existed like long into the early 1900s, right? These like poor houses? Right. Yes. Yes. This is like an early poor workhouse. Yeah. Like Dickensian workhouse. Yeah. This is like the proto Proto. version of that. Mm -hmm. That's Bridewell. Bridewell, not Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is therefore one of the few metropolitan hospitals to have survived the dissolution of monasteries physically intact. And the joint administration continues, not without interference by both the Crown and the City, until the incorporation into the National Health Service in 1948. So Bethlehem is in this dual, like, it is owned by the Crown and run by the city. But the city handles its administration until 1948. Okay, so that's a good chunk of time. A really good chunk of time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. About 
just a little bit over 400 years. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's unknown when Bethlehem or Bedlam began to specialize in the care and control of the quote unquote insane, but it has been frequently asserted that Bethlehem was first used for treating the severely mentally ill from 1377. At the very latest, it was accepting distracted persons at the beginning of the 15th century and came to serve only this function by the mid 16th century. And there's a report of visitation in 1403 that first documents this when it finds six men, quote unquote, menti capti, seized in mind, and three other, quote unquote, infirm persons in the hospital. Okay. So before Shakespeare was writing, before Shakespeare's institution writing. had transformed into a place for the, you know, quote unquote, insane. Right. That was its main purpose. Yes. In fact, by 1575, just before the first theater opened, Bethlehem Hospital was one of five specialized charitable hospitals operated by the City of London. Each hospital was situated on a major thoroughfare near one of the city's nine gates. So, I would say, which is a great way to someone comes into London and you're like, I don't want them around. They seem like they're, you know, distressed. Just, you know, shove them into this conveniently placed hospital. I mean, it's also that. By this time, the city was expanding beyond the wall. So these are actually just kind of like part of the first like suburbs of the city of London. Okay. And it's really not considered too outside. Okay. But it is very easily accessible. Mm -hmm. So first we have Bethlehem Hospital, which is for the distracted poor outside Bishopsgate. Then, like I mentioned before, Bridewell, which is a workhouse for the quote unquote vagrant poor. It's outside Ludgate. Uh Uh-huh. We then have Christ Hospital for Orphans inside Newgate. Mm-hmm. St. Bartholomew's is outside Aldersgate, and St. Thomas's is across from London Bridge and Southwark. Both of those were for the sick poor. Okay. These institutions were, for London citizens, a source of civic pride and an emblem of civic responsibility. And the most physical manifestations of the city's expanse of interlocking networks of charitable relief for the poor, the sick, and the otherwise disadvantaged. It was less like shove them away and more like we take care of, of our the people. people who cannot take care of themselves. I see. So just to put this into perspective, this is less Sweeney Todd. It's something Very separate much less from Sweeney Todd. So we're not at Sweeney Todd quite yet. No, no, no. And in fact, I think in our second parter, we will see how the hospitals of Sweeney Todd's time kind of create the narrative that we have about this time Great. in order to say, well, it's better than that. I see. And really what we have in the actual physical record of this time is that actually this was not that bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's a great clarification because yeah, my mind goes to like the Sweeney Todd narrative. Right. Yeah. And that's not to say that these were like... Perfect. You know, yeah, this is not perfect, but a lot of... What I'm about to get into is how our concept of treatment of Bedlam really comes from the Sweeney Todd times, not these times. Noted. Okay. Yeah. So back to like these hospitals as like institutions, comparing them directly to the theaters, which we do know a lot about um, and are painted a lot of times in our shared cultural mind as more positive than these hospitals. When we actually compare them at this time, The hospitals, although sometimes outside the city gates, are within its expanding wards and administrative structures. The theaters are not. The hospitals are centuries old and have long staying power. And in contrast, at their inception, the theaters are entirely outside the city's administrative wards and like deep in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. They are new and really far from being permanent. Mm -hmm. Hospitals are seen as ancient public charitable institutions administered and supported by the city of London. And theaters are newly erected for private gain and patronized by the crown. The hospitals are for relief, while theaters are for recreation. Okay, so this is the mental, uh, the mentality of the value. The value, of each. Yeah. right? So I think if you went to a early modern Londoner at the time, these hospitals are something that has always existed. They are an institution, and theaters, uh, they're new and, you know, might be just a fad. Got it. Bethlehem at the time is by far the smallest and least well-endowed of all of the hospitals. 
We do have estimates of what the original buildings were like because Bedlam has moved and a newer hospital has been built since these times. But we do have estimates based on a late 1677 ground plan of what these buildings were like. Mm -hmm. So Patricia Allridge estimates that while its exact size and disposition are not known, there was a long-running building from east to west um, that was the main hospital proper and included a small north-south wing at the west end, taken together with the two tenements at the east end of the map that we have, which were occupied by the steward and porter. The whole hospital measured 200 feet in length in 1677 and was 51 feet wide at the west end. Okay. And then all that's known of its interior in its first 430 years of existence is wow. a 1632 entry quoted in 19th century report that lists on the ground floor a parlor, a kitchen, two larders, a long entry throughout the house, and 21 rooms where the poor distracted people lie, and above the stairs, eight rooms for more servants and the poor to lie in. What we don't know is how were patients dispersed, what were these rooms actually used for, where the entry was. Which is fascinating because this is a institution that Londoners were proud of. Right. So the fact that we know so little is interesting to me. Yeah. Exactly. And what Carol Thomas Neely argues is that us knowing so little is actually a really great indication of proof that people actually didn't go there for entertainment. Mm. So there's this prevailing idea of like, oh, we go watch Bedlam beggars. We like go see them like as a form of entertainment during this time. And Carol Thomas Neely argues that we know so little about what this was like during this time that it's really unlikely that people were doing that because we would have like drawings. We would have things like we have like the theater. Diary entries. Yeah. Yeah. That talk about Bedlam. And I'll get to that in a moment. I want to talk really quickly about treatment of patients and how patients were treated. Mm -hmm. So there were stringent admission protocols that were designed to screen out all but the most distracted and needy. You had to get a warrant certifying the petitioner was distracted and poor, but not diseased, feigning, criminal, or simple-minded. Okay. Wow. So there's actually more protections for patients than would later come in the, like, asylums. Right. So if somebody was diseased, like sick, or quote-unquote simple-minded, those people yeah. were expected to be taken care of by their families. I see. Or they needed to go to the hospital for the sick poor, not right. the hospital for the... the distracted poor. Right. Upper-class individuals can still get in if they get the right warrant, because rich people can do anything that they yeah. want to do. Mm -hmm. Some things changed. haven't changed. And then once someone was cured, they were supposedly promptly discharged to make room because beds were so in demand at Bethlehem. And then if people were found to be frauds, if they were faking their madness, they were sent to the less desirable Bridewell Hospital for work rather than cure. Oh, so as a form of punishment or no? I would say more like no. The workhouse was not quite the workhouse that we again think of when we think of like Dickens, Sweeney Todd. And again, yeah, I'm thinking like Downton Abbey. Right. This is we're going to take care of you. You don't want to go find a job. We are going to house you and give you a job so that you are a functioning member of our society. Provide you. Because it's so important for us as early modern English Protestants to be contributors to society. But you're not going out and doing it yourself. So we're going to give it to you at Bridewell. Okay. But some people still didn't want that. So they would try to feign mental illness to get into Bethlehem where they could relax for a little bit. Okay. No, this is really good that we're doing this because right now we are at this moment removing my preconceived notions and the idea that I have that so much of these, this institution is uh, nefarious in ways. You know, all of these institutions are nefarious mm -hmm. in my mind because of, like you said, the Sweeney Todd narrative that we have and the more modern ones. So tell me more. Tell me more that I need to remove from my preconceived yeah. notions. You've set me up really well. So far from being condemned or mocked, characterized as inhuman, as animal-like, or as outside humanity, which we see in later depictions, the patients at 
Bethlehem during this time period are attended to with concern and compassion. There's this assumption that they have a temporary loss of self that can be recovered or restored to memory through care. Great. We see in Bedlam censuses of 1598 and 1624 and a list of patients granted apparel in 1607. We get an idea of how people moved through Bedlam and what treatment was like. In 1598, there was a mix of poor patients, which we know that they were poor because they were given uh, Mm -hmm. smocks or shirts, smocks being like dresses upon arrival. So if you were poor, you would get clothed here. Wow. Poor patients are definitely favored over rich ones, though we do have Mm -hmm. some higher status inhabitants mixed in. There's no evidence that men or women were more likely to be confined. Their numbers remain approximately equal during this time. However, the later census in 1624 may hint at differential attitudes, like we were talking about earlier, that slight Mm -hmm. sexism towards ill men and women, but not necessarily differential treatments. For example, no man is designated in that census as mad, while women are. And we can acknowledge that, yes, women may have been more acutely ill. They may have also just been viewed as more acutely ill because frantic madness is a greater disruption of normative femininity than normative masculinity. Right. Going back to the humors, it's more acceptable for men to be choleric and women to be phlegmatic. Right. So some form of distraction would mm-hmm. be much more disruptive in a phlegmatic woman than a choleric man. Right. And like I was saying a few minutes ago, there's just this overwhelming lack of evidence that people went to Bedlam during this time period to be entertained and to like mock the ill for their own entertainment. And we know this because there's just like you were saying, like there's this lack of information about this place. There's a lack of complaints or anything about the interior or its inhabitants. There must have been visitors because people went there to bring in distracted persons or take them home when they recovered or to visit their friends and family or leave donations or like if they were part of the court of aldermen who were the city group that was in charge of the administration. Mm -hmm. They were going there to check on it all these people would have had business there. But because we don't have the like, oh, I went to go, you know, watch. We don't have like drawings or diary entries of a person who has no other business there mm-hmm. talking about their experience there. Right. Exposing the inhumane mm-hmm. hospitals yeah. or pamphlets. Yeah. Again, to compare this back to the theaters, theaters were regularly closed down for plague. The hospital wasn't. Mm. The theaters were censured for the disruptions their crowds caused in their neighborhoods. And Bedlam especially was in this neighborhood that had some wealthy mansions on one side and then apartment buildings or tenements on the other, rental properties on the other. They were in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And if there was, you know, the Sweeney Todd screaming of all hours of the night of patients, we would have complaints. We would have written records. Yeah. Especially comparing like to the theater, for example, complaints permanently closed the first Blackfriars Theater when its neighbors generated a petition that stopped Burbage from opening a new playhouse there in 1596. It argued that the common playhouse will grow to be very great annoyance and trouble, (laughs) both by the reason of the great resort and gathering together of all manner of vagrant and lewd persons that under color of resorting to the plays will come thither and work all manner of mischief. And also to the great pestering and filling up of the same precinct, if it should please God to send any visitation of sickness as to heretofore hath been. That is from Gers Shakespearean stage. And it's a footnote in Carol Thomas Neely's uh-huh. book. Yeah. So essentially, the theater is going to inspire audiences to be rowdy. And if we are going through a patch of plague, it's a source for passing along the sickness. Mm-hmm. So theaters need to be shut down as a preventative measure. Yes, but specifically, like, this place of entertainment will bring crowds. Crowds are a problem for plague. Crowds are a problem for the neighborhood. Not in my backyard. Yeah. And we don't have that for this hospital. Okay. We do know that conditions weren't great in terms of, like, the building's upkeep. Kitchen sinks were clogged. Tiles were often missing from the floors. And there's, like, one record that people often point to to go, oh, look, no, people did go like to a showing of Bethlehem is the quote. Mm -hmm. It's one record that exists from prior to 1632. But Carol Thomas Neely argues that 
If you read it closely, it likely does not refer to the hospital at all. This record details visits to the Tower of London by children of Henry Percy, who was the ninth Earl of Northumberland and was living at the Tower palatially, and then the London entertainment that they were provided while they were visiting. It includes a quote-unquote show of Bethlehem, but again, Thomas Neely argues that like it can't be the hospital. Based on the surrounding entries, we know that the record was written sometime between June 1610 and February 1611. Bedlam in 1610 and its inhabitants were not in a condition that would have led to it being visited by four aristocratic children. From records in 1598, we know that the house was in disrepair. Again, those like clogged sinks, tiles missing from the floors. And the inhabitants were very old, very poor, and very ill and couldn't have put on a show for children ages 8 to 12. Yeah, they're not spry enough for like high energy children's play. Yeah. yeah children's theater. Yeah. And then... Bethlehem Hospital is almost never referred to as Bethlehem in official court documents. So Carol Thomas Neely argues that this line in a record about the Percy children's activities could very possibly mean instead that they went to see a Christmas play or puppet show that involved the Judean city of Bethlehem instead of Bedlam. And that's what I was wondering is a show could mean a play that was brought to them or that they went to, but it's not the hospital. Right. But it's not going to see the hospital. And there's just no other recorded trace of visitors to Bethlehem Hospital for entertainment. Mm -hmm. The only place we see that idea is early modern drama. Some fiction. A bit yes. of fiction. A bit of fiction, which we'll have to save for our part two episode on mental health and disability in Shakespeare's time and the theater in four weeks. Mm -hmm. So join us in four weeks as we look at how all of these elements take to the stage in early modern England and beyond. Thank you for listening to this episode. Our kind listeners, we can no other answer make, but thanks and thanks and ever thanks to our Patreon patrons. Collective Action Comics Podcast, and Devin Smith. I'm Courtney Smith. And I'm Elise Sharp. This is Shakespeare Anyone. Thank you so much for listening to Shakespeare Anyone. Works referenced in this episode are available in the episode description. Our theme music is Never Ending Minute by Sounds Like Sander. If you would like to support us, it would help us out if you would hit the subscribe button, like us, leave a comment, write a review, share us on social media, tell a friend about us, all the things. We'd appreciate it. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash Shakespeare Anyone. Patreon patrons get access to exclusive bonus content throughout the year. The link is also in the episode description. For more, you can visit our website, shakespeareanyone.com, follow us on Instagram at shakespeareanyonepod, or Twitter at shakespeareanyone. For Twitter, that's Shakespeare Any and the number one. Every other platform is spelled out like the name of the podcast. Now, because you listened all the way to the end of the credits, here's a completely random Shakespeare quote for you. From Sir Thomas More, Scene 10, spoken by Shrewsbury. The like unto the honored Earl of Surrey.